Let us look at the next slide, which gives you the features of the historical place. Shakespeare's histories focus on English monarchs. They usually play upon Elizabethan propaganda. The monarchs can be one of the greatest Tudor monarchs like Henry V. It can be one of the enemy of the Tudors like King Richard III. I've already mentioned to you that he was a great admirer of the Tudor dynasty. When critics look at his plays, when historians look at his plays, they point out a number of mistakes. But I don't think Shakespeare was, was writing history. He was writing historical plays. So he did have the imagination. He probably had a writer's right to play with it as he wanted to. So there would be exaggerations. There would be probably omissions. There would probably be additions to the actual history as it happened. But we must say that he was able to create these kings, these monarchs, these villains, Falstaff, who I mentioned already in the historical place. Let us now go on to looking at the tragic hero. Who is a tragic hero? I need to talk about him in particular because as students of Shakespeare, one of the favorite questions that we have for you when you have to write a long answer is discuss, elaborate, uh, enumerate the qualities of Hamlet, the characteristic features of Hamlet that make him a tragic hero. Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, Julius Caesar, whoever you're studying. So what is, who is a tragic hero? Number one, he must be a person of some stature or high position, such as a king, a general, or a nobleman. He must be a good person. He must matter to us and we must see him as a worthwhile person. I want to tell you here, my dear students, that all these heroes of Shakespeare's tragedies seem real. Seem as if, oh well, he's like someone I know. Of course it's possible for postponement. All of us are always postponing. Of course it is possible to trust someone we love. The trust could be misplaced, but we don't mistrust our own children. So when you look at the tragic heroes, they are all believable characters. And because of his position, his actions usually have far-reaching effects. In fact, he even talks about no meteors are seen when ordinary people die. Because there was a belief in the Elizabethan age that if you saw a meteor, you know a meteor, shooting star as we call it now, if you saw that in the sky, it was an indication that some tragedy was going to befall that country. He must have a character trait or quality which under normal circumstances may be a virtue. Remember, I talked about ambition, I talked about trust. But under the special circumstances of the play proves to be a fatal flaw. And here I have for you a Greek word, hamartia. It is the tragic flaw that leads to his downfall. Once his downward uh, slide begins, what happens? He makes mistake after mistake, what Hamlet does. He pretends to be mad because of which Ophelia begins to believe that she does not, he does not love her. He f gets into that duel with Laertes, who is Ophelia's brother and one of his own dear friends. He has decided that Polonius is responsible for creating that doubt in the mind of Ophelia. So what does Hamlet do? One after the other, one after the other, he makes more and more mistakes. You can look at any one of the characters and you will see what I am saying. You look at Macbeth, yes, King Duncan had to be killed. And then Banco, and then Banco's son, and so it goes on. So what happens to our tragic heroes? The fall begins. And once the fall begins, we reach the climax. The climax might seem like, you know, the top. But remember, in a tragedy, it's not the culmination. It is what is called the denouma. Spelt denouement, but pronounced denouma. Right? French word, so pronounced differently from how we write it. So, we were just looking at the characteristics of the tragic hero. Let's go back to the slide and see 
he must elicit both pity and fear from the audience. Remember, Aristotle had talked about the importance of catharsis. So what happens when I go back? After seeing Hamlet, after reading Hamlet, I decide I must act now. I must not postpone any action which is important. What happens when I go after I see Macbeth? I tell myself I should be ambitious, but there should be a limit for ambition. So, he must elicit both pity and fear from the audience. And the end of the tragic hero, he recognizes his mistakes, but he must die. He must die. When King Lear realizes that he has been unfair to Cordelia and that his two daughters the beautiful imagery, animal imagery that Shakespeare uses to describe Goneril and Regan, the two daughters, the two older daughters of King Lear. And King Lear dies at the end. Macbeth dies, Othello dies, Hamlet dies. Julius Caesar, of course, dies almost at the beginning. Romeo and Juliet, both of them die. Think of any of the tragedies of Shakespeare that you know. It doesn't happen in all tragedies. But it certainly happens in Shakespeare's tragedies that the hero must die at the end. Because that leaves the audience with a feeling that, well, this is not what one should be doing. If I were in that place, if I had the same kind of situation to face, maybe I should now act differently. That is what catharsis, the cleansing, is all about. What about his style? Let's look at the next uh, slide. His style were originally, the first ones, were written in the conventional style of the day. Later, he went on to using a lot of metaphors, rhetorical phrases. That was his ability to use the English language so well. He was very innovative. He could create his own style. He used a metrical pattern in almost all his plays. But you would notice, my dear students, when you read the plays, that sometimes he has prose for the uh, less important characters, I could say. So the major characters will be speaking in poetry, but the less important characters may speak in prose, a kind of variation in meter in the rhythm of the play which makes it immediately obvious that we are looking at a different kind of character. I'm sure Shakespeare did this purposely, consciously, knowingly, because he wanted to make a difference between the main characters and the not-so-main characters. Okay, so now I have to talk about an important part of Shakespeare's drama, particularly his tragedies. And I have for you a couple of soliloquies. What is a soliloquy? A soliloquy is different from a monologue because in a monologue the character speaks and there are listeners. But in a soliloquy it is as if he is speaking to himself. What does that mean? What is happening in my mind? How will the audience come to know? So usually on the Shakespearean stage, if you can imagine the stage, remember, it's a circular stage. If you can imagine that stage or any stage, even our stages today, the character who is now going to have a soliloquy will go to one part of the stage. The other characters are already on the stage, but he will do it in such a way so that the audience gets the feeling that the others cannot hear. Remember, it's a dramatic technique that they use. And so you cannot argue saying, but why can't they hear? Why don't they hear? You can't. It's a dramatic technique. And Shakespeare used the soliloquies very beautifully in most of his plays and particularly in his tragedies. So I have for you now one such soliloquy, which I would like to read to you. And I want you to look at the screen and maybe read along with me. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, 
or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep no more and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep perchance, to dream, I bears the rub. I want to get away from this life. This life is so terrible for me. I don't have a single friend. I suspect everyone around me. This is what Hamlet is saying. And therefore, he questions. The question arises in his mind whether it's worth living. To be or not to be? Should I continue to live or should I not live? That is the question. And what does he imagine? Why? Because he is tired of the kind of lie that he is living. And what is this lie, my dear students? I'm giving you examples of Hamlet because I'm sure you've heard more of Hamlet than the other plays. But I could give you examples from Macbeth or Othello or King Lear for the same. But since I have a soliloquy from Hamlet, I'm explaining the soliloquy to you by telling you the frame of mind in which he is then. Remember, he was at college. He was called back because his father had died. According to the story, his father had died because there was poison in his ear. He was sleeping in the garden and a snake injected some poison into his ear. That is the story. But when he comes back and he meets his friends, he knows that he knows that it's not true because the ghost, his father's ghost appears and tells him that he has to take revenge on the uncle who is now the king. And more shockingly for him, my dear friends, remember that his mother had married that same man, the murderer. But the king, the original king, that is Hamlet's father, also tells him to leave Gertrude to her fate. But Gertrude is with Claudius. How does he take revenge on Claudius without harming Gertrude also? And he pretends to be mad, so he loses his lady love. The sweet, innocent Ophelia, who drowns herself, who commits suicide. And a heartbroken brother decides to have revenge, to avenge the death of his dear sister, and so he challenges Hamlet to a duel where he's killed. Now, under this background, do you think Hamlet would want to live on, my dear students? Do you think so? And that is why Hamlet has this beautiful soliloquy, to be or not to be. I have another soliloquy, which we won't have the time to read. But I would suggest that you go back, try and read this about Prospero, I've taken it from another play. Before we end this lecture, I just want to give you an idea of what critics, other writers, other thinkers have said about Shakespeare. We, can, we could fill libraries and libraries with criticism of Shakespeare, with books that have been written on Shakespeare. And we are still writing because there is so much. We can never reach the bottommost, the nadir, the deepmost pit of Shakespeare's writing. So we have new theories being applied every day. Once you had Freud and you had the psychological explanation, we did something with Hamlet. Then you have the neoclass, I'm sorry, you have the post-colonial approach and then we are doing something with the Tempest and so it goes on and on. But three short quotations before I end this session, my dear students. He breathed upon dead bodies and brought them into life, nor sequent centuries could hit orbit and some of Shakespeare's wit. We cannot. It was as if he brought the dead back to life. He infused life into the lifeless. Can we ever sum up this? No, says Emerson. What does T.S. Eliot say? We can say of Shakespeare that never has a man turned so little knowledge to such great account. Remember, we said he was only a school dropout. So how did he know so much? And William Hazlitt, remember, along with Charles Lamb, we remember him as one of the great romantic uh, essays. What does he say? If we wish to know the force of human genius, we should read Shakespeare. If we wish to see the insignificance of human learning, 
we may study his commentators. He's giving all of us advice. Don't read critics, read the text itself. So what will I tell you, my dear students? Don't read the notes, read the text itself. What have we done in this one hour is to very, very quickly, almost like running a race, trying, I have tried to bring to you the greatness of Shakespeare as a dramatist. I hope you have enjoyed the lecture and more importantly, I hope I have inspired you to go back and read Shakespeare, read the text of Shakespeare so that you can really understand the greatness of this dramatist who lived and died 400 years ago. Thank you very much. Sandhan, all Gujarat integrated classroom. Satellite na madhyam ti jodti kadi, itle Sandhan.